Hi, you're okay, good. so okay. we are live. This is Craig Watts and it's Utah Mandarin Families. And we are so excited tonight to have uh, a guest speaker, um, someone who can provide some advice for us and some perspective. It's Elizabeth Weiss. And just I'll just go through a couple of bullet points. I think a lot of you have seen uh, her bio on the announcement, but a couple of the highlights. So currently working as a journalist for USA Today, award-winning journalist and covering COVID, uh, you know, a lot of things in that area. So a busy person. And so we feel really lucky to catch her in the middle of this. And we hope we're getting a turn for the better on COVID, but maybe that might be a subtopic we can talk about tonight <laughs> because it, it matters in, to all of us in the Ch US-China relations. But also the author of A Parent's Guide to Mandarin Immersion, okay, a book that is, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later into the questions. So, and then also the author of the uh, Mandarin Immersion Parents blog. So this is started, I think, is it all the way back to 2012? Or maybe even before that. Maybe um, yeah, eleven or twelve. But for me, it's the only real resource I've found nationally that can really kind of draw a picture of what's going on across the country, different programs, and then it has this incredible list of all the programs in the U.S. that's updated in a, a downloadable file. And I mean, you can go on there and find your school, find other schools in other states. It's really an amazing list. That's a lot of work. And then there's a ton of articles, blog articles on the site. Um, you know, interviewing, there's quite a few about Utah there too, you know, when we get a new high school opening, new, new school openings, and then um, profiles of different programs. So the Mandarin Immersion Parents blog, highly recommend that. And then um, Elizabeth's also the mother of two daughters who have gone completely through a Mandarin Immersion program and coming out the other side. So a lot of experience that way too. So that's just some bullet points to introduce Elizabeth. Um, and uh, if it's okay, I'll just jump right into the questions or do you want, is there something, does that sound good? So just wanted to start at the beginning um, and you can define that how you will, but um, tell us when and how you got interested in China and Chinese. Why did this become a thing for you? Um, let's see, I'm hearing an echo, but hopefully it won't do anything strange. Um, so for me personally, uh, I grew up in Seattle um, and I went to a, a Catholic high school, Seattle Prep, um, and it was named after Matteo Ricci, who was a famous Jesuit, a Jesuit high school, a famous Jesuit who went to China, learned Chinese, lived there for decades, um, proselytized in China, uh, and wrote, I think, one of the first dictionaries in Chinese. Um, but actually, the thing it was not, it had nothing to do with, the program had nothing to do with China. They were just trying to, I don't know, market it, I think. But I, in algebra class, I sat next to a guy named Tim Louie, and he was Chinese American, and he had to go to Saturday school, which he hated, and he had to um, practice his characters. And so I would sit next to him in math class, and uh, I would help him with math, and then he'd be doing his characters. And I'd say, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm writing characters. And I'd say, oh, show me how to do that. And so then I was writing characters, though my handwriting was never as good as his. And and that, when I was 15, 14, I guess, just, I, I fell in love with Chinese. I, I don't know why, but I did. And uh, I, I really wanted to go to China and study. Um, and this, I am old, this was in the eighties. It was hard. Uh, I said, so I studied Chinese at the University of Washington. Um, was, it was pretty, I should have gone and like spent a year in China, but it was, for reasons that now seem stupid, it seemed too hard to do, and so I didn't. And now I always tell kids, get out, go, forget, you know, borrow some money, make these things happen because you're not going to have time later in life. And you imagine you will, oh, when I graduate, I'll get to do it. No, you won't, um, unless you make it happen. But uh, after I got out of, so I studied Chinese at the University of Washington. Uh, uh, though I ended up majoring in Swedish because I also speak Swedish. And um, so Swedish literature, not one of the more remunerative majors in the world, uh, but it made me happy. And ended up working in China on and off, um, never long-term, uh, and then got into journalism and was really hoping to go to China as a, a foreign correspondent. But I was working for the Associated Press and basically the way it worked at the AP at that time was that you, um, you had to work on the international desk in New York 
and you kind of got there and then you waited for, there was only two people in the Beijing bureau and you waited until something opened up. And I talked to the editor, the guy who was in charge of it. And he said, well, I got six people backed up on that desk. So that's a 10 year wait. So you can come on out here to New York and you'll spend 10 years on the overnight in New York on the international desk. And I was like, Ugh, maybe not. Um, and I started writing about this thing that nobody cared about and was not, was this weird thing called the internet. Uh, and so that kind of took off. <laughs> and so I ended up covering tech for a decade. Uh, and then I retooled as a science writer and went back and covered science for a decade. Um, and I had just shifted to covering climate change and energy transition. Um, actually, Utah is doing some fascinating things with energy transition. And I kind of thought my science and, and I covered infectious disease and I thought that was long over. And then uh, this pandemic hit and they said, hey, you used to write about infectious disease. You wanna come back and do it. And so that's what I've been doing the last eight months. So. So long story short, I never really got to use my Chinese and my Chinese has now faded into sadness, really. Um, I still speak Swedish, but I do not speak Chinese or I don't say I do because it's sad. But uh, in San Francisco, um, when my daughter was in preschool, I read a little thing in the local parent network saying that the San Francisco public schools were gonna launch a Mandarin immersion program which was great because we have a long-standing Cantonese immersion program in San Francisco and no, I, I mean, nothing ill towards Cantonese, which is a, is a is storied and literary language, but I had studied Mandarin and I, if I, my kids were going to study Chinese, I wanted them to learn Mandarin and, and somebody said, well, have them learn Cantonese and then they can learn Mandarin later. And I'm like, that's like telling somebody Oh, learn Portuguese now, and then later on you can study Spanish. Um, so I was kind of like, oh, I don't think Cantonese. And then they opened up Mandarin, Mandarin Immersion, and I said, Well, that's it. So we signed Ellie up, and uh, she started. And then Margaret came two years later, and she started. And Eleanor is now a sophomore at Wellesley, uh, Wellesley College in Massachusetts. She just declared her major this week, which is international relations slash history. Um, and she, I was very impressed. She got herself an internship in Taiwan this summer, uh, but unclear if she'll be able to go because Taiwan isn't letting folks in because of COVID. So we'll see. So I, my, and my kids gripe at me that why did you know? You, well, they they griped a lot more before. Why are you making us do this really hard thing? I think now they're starting to realize that, oh, huh, this is this is actually not. It's not not useful that I speak Chinese when we do not speak it at home. Um, but for a long time, they griped at me, and I used to say, "The reason you're in Mandarin immersion is so your Chinese does not sound like my Chinese." <laughs> so they're through the program, and um, how was it in the beginning? Like, was it you know? There's different kinds of programs, and I don't think the parents here are all familiar with you know. In Utah, we've got a 50-50, and it's basically um, you know teaching. Chinese, I mean, we learn content in Chinese yeah. here, but it's like non, it's a, it's a program geared for non-speakers. You know, there's 90-10, there's, there's two-way immersion. What kind of thing was it in San Francisco? Well, you guys do live in like Mandarin immersion paradise. You live in language immersion paradise. I, Utah is so forward thinking when it comes to immersion and language. I mean, no other state comes close. Uh, the fact that you do it at a state level, the fact that it's it's overseen by the State Department of Education, um, the fact that you they coordinate, which no other state does. I mean, Delaware does a tiny bit and uh, Michigan a tiny bit, but I mean, Utah is head and shoulders above anybody else. Um, so what you're saying is some of the school, some of the other states, it's just a local school or a district that's that's doing the program. It's not oh, a yeah. statewide. Yeah, it, it's yeah. totally, it's the district, it's the state. And so in San Francisco, we, the Mandarin immersion and, and Utah didn't really do this. Mandarin, a lot of Mandarin immersion programs got their start for two reasons. One, because there was federal funding in the um, early 2000s for uh, underrepresented languages, basically languages the Department of Defense needed people to speak 
you could study Uyghur or you could study Russian or you could study Mandarin and, and schools were like, oh, we could get money to do Mandarin. That like nobody really wanted to have a Uyghur immersion school. Um, though these days, but yeah, that's we'll talk about that at another time. So um, San Francisco and the other thing is you could if you could make a case that your district, you were serving English language learners who spoke the language, you could also get funding. The, the truth is, is that there's almost no, dis, I, I, I have yet to find a school district where there are large numbers of monolingual Mandarin speaking kids coming in. Most of the, most times it's the kids coming monolingual Cantonese speakers. And it's really iffy whether or not you could, you could make a case that somebody who speaks, grew up speaking Cantonese, who shows up in kindergarten and fifth grade is being served under the Supreme Court ruling the Lao decision by having Mandarin education, because it's a different language. But San Francisco, that's what they said. That's what they're gonna do. So San Francisco Public Schools launched Star King Elementary, um, named after a famous Unitarian minister here. And two years later, they launched Jose Ortega. I love it that Jose Ortega Elementary School was the Mandarin Immersion Program. So we had two elementary schools feeding to a middle school, feeding to a high school. We started out 90-10, moved to 80-20. Um, theoretically two-way, theoretically we were supposed to have kids who came in monolingual Mandarin speakers, kids who were monolingual English speakers, and everybody would learn together. Truth be told, it was mostly English speakers. I mean, we had a fair number of Cantonese speakers, but again, the Mandarin wasn't that helpful for them. Uh, I will say that San Francisco, I'm sure you've read about our lovely school district and our lovely um, uh, board of education and kind of how they're trashing the entire school district of late. Uh, they re, they're re Lincoln, which is where the immersion program led, they're changing the name because, because Lincoln was not politically correct enough. And, and I say that as a, as a liberal San Franciscan, I mean, yeah. anyway. Um, San Francisco public schools have now stopped immersion at sixth grade because they decided it was inequitable past sixth grade to allow students to, it wasn't fair that there were kids in middle school who got Mandarin when there were kids in that same middle school who didn't, even though the district created the program because they had two schools that were empty and they were going to have to close them and this brought in families. San Francisco is a horrible role model. I mean, early on they were a great role model, but it's become so political here that no no school district would ever want to follow what we're doing for immersion. And in fact, in many ways, I think uh, Utah has become the kind of the the uh, the place to to go to learn about how you do immersion well. So. Yeah, I think, you know, I've been studying a little bit about immersion and I didn't understand the equity piece. And I think a lot of people in Utah don't understand how immersion fits with equity issues, right? See, like in, in Utah, Utah gets criticized because a lot of times they want to use immersion as a way to um, help students get to grade level in a two-way immersion program, right? Like you'd have Spanish students Spanish speaking students that would be half of the class and English students the other half and both groups do better when they have that two way immersion right and so for a lot of areas in the US Mandarin immersion is about trying to make education more equitable. It theoretically Spanish immersion really works that way Spanish immersion is kind of one of these beautiful win win situations I mean you get monolingual Spanish speaking kids coming in often from. Uh, underserved families, you have, off, it's almost always uh, middle and upper middle class white families who, who are drawn to a school they would never ever have sent their kids to otherwise. They come in, all those families together, build up the school, both, both kids, the Spanish speakers and the English speakers become fluent in the other language. Um, so in, in, and there's a ton of data that the Spanish speakers learn English much better if they're surrounded by English speakers. The English speakers learn Spanish much better if they're surrounded by Spanish speakers. I mean, it is kind of one of those educational, like it's very seldom in education where something just works great. Right. Um, Mandarin immersion is harder because it's, it's a rare, I mean, Cupertino is perhaps one of the few places where you have a lot of kids coming in who speak Mandarin. Most kids who come in speaking Mandarin 
come from bilingual households already. So they, they speak both languages. Um, and if you hang out on the playground at a lot of schools, even in California, like the kids are all speaking English because these are not children who come in only speaking Mandarin. Um, but, but theoretically there is, and especially with Spanish, um, I've also seen it with Vietnamese. Uh, in Sacramento, we have a Hmong um, mm -hmm. immersion school. And that is, I don't think they have many English speakers coming in actually, but, but yeah, in terms of equity for Spanish, it is, it is fantastic. Um, for Mandarin, it's, it's less so, but it has, the other thing it does is it, um, and a lot of school districts use Mandarin immersion programs to, to bring in families who might not, I mean, some states like Minnesota is a state, it's a state choice school. You can go to any school in the state, no matter where you live. And so schools buy for programs that will draw in parents. Um, in, in some suburbs, you'll see schools starting a Mandarin immersion program because it draws in families that might otherwise go to private schools. Um, and in fact, we saw that in San Francisco, a lot of families who otherwise had said, yeah, we probably would have gone private, but there was this fantastic program and it was free. And so this is what we did. Right. You know, in Utah, the situation a lot of times is you'll have a native speaker and then you'll have two classes of um, non-speakers, right? And so, you know, if there were a way to have that two-way immersion where half of the class were native speakers of Chinese and the other half were native speakers of English, like they have in Spanish, that yeah. could potentially be ideal. And I was thinking like a program like that could maybe take off in China or even in the US if you were able to get half of the students to come and be in that school. Yeah. And maybe that wouldn't work until junior high, but just learning about immersion that made me think, wow, that's a model that you know could be interesting if we could figure out a way to get half of the class to be native Chinese. And because the, then, the, then the students teach each other instead of relying on one yeah. teacher, you've got the yeah. students who are playing together and teaching each other. And I mean, yeah. We saw that a little bit in our um, in the middle school program here because there was a there was a big influx of uh, San Francisco school district is a third Chinese American. And there's a lot of Chinese immigrants, and so they had if kids came in like new immigrants came in from China, even if they spoke Cantonese at home, and a lot of the families did. They had in China all schooling is in Mandarin, and so by middle school. They were actually they had been learning in Mandarin for six years at that point. And so they they let those kids into the Chinese subject matter classes in the middle school in immersion, you know, because you guys do the same thing. They were taking um, uh, social studies. And that really was, I mean, we saw it at work. That was this fantastic thing where, you know, all these 12 year olds who'd gone to school in China came in and and suddenly like the, the American kids were learning slang in Chinese and they were kind of getting into the latest Chinese songs. And, you know, they were all watching um, Mandarin soap operas on TV. I mean, that was really that kind of cross-cultural learning that you would love to see. Um, it's just hard because, I mean, the other thing is, and I don't think it's as big a deal in, in uh, Utah, but in a lot of places, if you, even if you have Mandarin speaking families, it's very hard to get them to do an immersion program because they're so concerned their kids won't learn English. And what they don't realize is how quickly their kids will lose Chinese. Um, yeah, I think a lot of Chinese parents struggle to have their kids maintain their Chinese here. And yeah. maybe a program can help out with that. Um, maybe just a question about what the trends are in the US in terms of Mandarin immersion, like, are we seeing, because there were, there were times where we had bursts of all these programs opening, and, you know, are we in the middle of a real growth phase, or is it plateauing, and and what are the reasons for that, and then the other thing would be in terms of trends for, you know, is it 90-10, is it 50-50, like, mm -hmm. what are we seeing for trends across the country? 50-50 is pretty common, and it's growing more common, 90-10, um, 50-50, and, uh, um, simplified characters. Uh, Thai, uh, uh, and I say this to friends from Taiwan, I'm like, I'm so sorry, but China won. They won this round. It's, it's gonna be as, as beautiful as traditional characters are, it's gonna be simplified characters your kids learn. Uh, the, I, think, I think we're at 75% of the programs in the country right now are 50-50 and the others are 90-10. There's, there's actually not a ton of data that, that there's a huge difference, really. 
Um, so I don't think because because the truth is that all the programs, whether they start at 90-10 or they start at 50-50, by fifth grade, they're all at 50-50. So everybody kind of lessens the Chinese. And then when you get to middle school, you usually have two classes, uh, one Mandarin language arts and one a, a subject matter course. And then in high school, you have one class taught in Mandarin. Um, and that, that's the model. And that's the Utah model, and it's it's pretty that's pretty common everywhere except in San Francisco where, where we've dismantled our program. Um, not that I am bitter or anything, but uh, <laughs> it's um, so that so that as for is it still growing? I, I mean, you, like the number of immersion programs, like it, there have been moments where there were bursts, like you said, early two thousands there was funding and maybe a lot opened, and then there maybe another burst around. Oh. There have yeah. been years when 25 programs have opened a year. I mean, sometimes it's funny though, like I, I, cause I do my list once a year and I need to do it this year. I haven't had time because of COVID, but I, so I will go through and update it. Like I could tell when a lot of the, the programs in Utah suddenly reached middle school because suddenly there was, I was like, why are there 10 new schools in, in Utah? And then I realized it was all the programs that had started a middle school program. Um, the so the we have seen it increase i think it's plateauing a bit and i think there are geopolitical reasons for that i think uh i mean you've spent a lot of time in china you know i've been going to china since the late 80s um china felt like an incredibly open and uh potential i mean every you wanted your kid to learn chinese because it was a really useful thing. And, and China was clearly gonna be a major player on the world stage. And, and, and that is still true today. I think given the tensions between China and the United States, which I hope are calming some right now, um, I think there has been less, uh, sc schools are a little hesitant to you know embrace Chinese if they were gonna start a new program because I think politically it felt a little fraught. Um, I hope that passes because I, I I think yeah. you know China and the United States are going to be two of the major world players for a very long time and having people who are conversant in both languages and both cultures is important to our world um, staying peaceful. Yeah, I mean we just had a flap in Utah. The state legislatures they got a resolution to close the Confucius Institute. You know, saying it's a a, a communist uh, propaganda thing that we is going to you know sort of brainwash our kids. There's that kind of stuff going on still. So yeah, it's kind of frustrating uh, because I do feel like, you know, the US and China, they got to work it out. And I think at the, at the, you know, common people level is kind of where things can get worked out because it seems like the politicians don't know the other side very well. <laughs> and our kids are going to be the ones doing that working out. I mean, right. that's what I keep telling high school students who are doing Mandarin. I'm like, listen, the State Department has been so hollowed out they have to hire so many people in the next eight years. There are a lot of jobs. Um, yeah, I, I the Confucian Institute. I really think it, it it is not a communist plot. It is a Tang Dynasty poetry plot because they seem to <laughs> so teach dangerous. Tang Dynasty poetry a lot. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's. I don't worry about anybody indoctrinating my kids in any political thing, but they certainly have learned a lot of Tang poetry. Right. Yeah. Um, maybe could you tell us a little bit about your book, like say the genesis of the book, The Parent's Guide to Mandarin Immersion and, and feedback on it, maybe where it stands? Uh, sure. So coffee. I'll, say, I'll put the link in the chat for people who are interested. I, I will. I will. The caveat with this is that I would write a really different book today as we've learned a lot and things have changed. This book got its genesis in um, I mean, I'm a reporter, it's what I do for a living. So I kind of gather information and write it up. And we had started a, I, and I'm so impressed with what you're doing in Utah. I mean, Utah really is a guiding light to a lot of Mandarin immersion programs around the country because in San Francisco, we had these two programs at two separate schools. The school district did nothing to try and bring us together. And we, as parents, we realized, especially as we were starting to get to middle school, we really needed to, to work together to make sure that the district indeed started a middle school program and to make sure that the one thing we see in some districts is if they have two schools, they diverge a bit. I mean, LA, LAUSD has done this. 
they've got, I think they're up to four Mandarin immersion programs, but they all teach totally different things. So when the kids come together at middle school, they don't have the same level. I mean, it's crazy. They have different vocabularies. They, many things are different. So we started uh, the Mandarin Immersion Parents Council here in San Francisco and parents from both schools and eventually the two grade schools in the middle school were doing it. And I started to, because I had studied Chinese, I mean, my Chinese was horrible, but at least I, you know, I knew what a tone was and I understood what a measure word was. And so I would write little articles for our newsletter about these things that, that parents who didn't have any Chinese connection didn't understand, or, you know, why do they give red envelopes or why does my Chinese, my teachers or my kid's teacher always go, why, why is her last name different than her husband's last name? Well, because that's what they do in China. Um, and, and out of that, I ended up with all of these columns that I'd written, which we ended up putting up on our blog, the Mandarin P Immersion Parents Council. And then at a certain point, I kind of thought, you know what, I'll just gather them all together. I'll put them in a book and I will be done. And, you know, that took turned out to take like three years, but, um, and I, and I did a lot of interviews and I did a lot of research and it was fantastic. I mean, I love Chinese, so it was great. Uh, I ended up putting it all into this book. It came, uh, but now, you know, a lot has changed. Uh, I think we've, we know one of the big issues that I talk about in the book is the reading problem and how kids in immersion, Chinese immersion don't learn to read as much as a lot of teachers think they should, and, and there wasn't much to read. Um, I think the knowledge immersion programs have of how to teach reading has changed and gotten better. I also know that there are a lot more materials that are interesting to read, because after a while you get tired of reading about the Monkey King. Uh, so there are many things I would do differently today. And, you know, I sometimes think, oh, gosh, I, I don't even know if I want people to still be reading it. But the baseline stuff is I think still helpful. And it gives you a sense of, of the history of, you know, because your kid really is coming into a program that is, um, is part of a, a national movement. And, and I think, I, I mean, my daughter, so the, I have a daughter who's a senior in high school right now, applying to colleges, the fact that she speaks Mandarin and that has been in immersion was huge in her college applications. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, we don't know where she'll get in yet because on April 1st is when we get the word, but I have a feeling that that will have stood her in very good stead. Um, and my older daughter got to Wellesley and was kind of like, I don't know what I want to take. And then realized, oh, I can take these very high level Chinese classes. And that lets me take these high level uh, history classes and then fell in love with international relations. So as I say in the book, when you put your kid in an immersion program, whatever language it is, it's not, I never expect that, you know, my children are gonna become Chinese translators or go work for the State Department or work in China. It's like the same reason you make them study algebra or um, calculus, because you wanna give them options later on. You wanna make sure that they have as many options as possible when they get to college or beyond. And this is one of those options and they may never use it and that's fine because it trained their brain, it opened their eyes to a broader piece of the world, and you never know. Right. Yeah, I think it's a great kind of point to maybe open it out to the parents a little bit, because in Utah, the first year students are now seniors in high school, so they're starting to get ready to do college, they're doing college applications, thinking about jobs in the future. Um, the other thing you said about reading, I think is really important, you know, like I've read that if kids aren't reading for pleasure in the language, you know, say even third and fourth grade, that it's hard to ever really get fluency because you just don't have enough practice. And if and and like you said, early on the materials were just not interesting. They didn't have we're so boring books. Yeah, but now you know China's exploding in terms of you know the internet and culture and and cool things that are fun even for kids here. And so to try to take advantage of that, you know, sometimes the programs are pulling out crusty old textbooks and expecting kids to read these things that have really like, you know, old fashioned gender roles and, and, and things that just are, sometimes we don't want our kids to, we want them to enjoy what they're doing and th that we need to take advantage of that. Um, and there's also, there's so many, um, there's so many great books being written, like, you know, these, these limited character books being written for Chinese language learners. Um, in fact, uh, oh, 
uh, the, the Mandarin Companion guys. Um, right. Jared were, Turner, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Mormons from Utah, right? Who went yeah. to uh, went to China and said, "Hey, there's nothing for us to read. We're going to make it happen." I mean, like their Sherlock Holmes is great. I mean, I could read it right. with help, and it was, you know, it was fun. I mean, it was a page turner. Well, you know, right. it wasn't Tom Clancy, but you know, it, it made me want to know what happened next. Right, and the point they make is when you're trying to prepare for the AP test, you've got to be able to read quickly and process information. And so you've got to be reading a lot through those yeah. early grades until you get to ninth grade, because if your reading is not up to speed, you're not going to have time to finish the questions yeah. to even get a guess at them. So yeah. I really feel like reading is a critical component. The other thing, and you've talked about this a little bit too, is getting to China. You know, like you said, just just buy the ticket, get over there. You know, like to, things like that can really energize your study and make it more relevant. I have talked too long. I mean, I went way longer, but I'm interested in a lot of things. What I want to do is open up to the parents uh, who have questions. And if you can, you can either just unmute yourself and talk because we don't have a huge group here. Or if you want to use like the hand thing that I can call on someone if, if you want to do it that way. But I'm interested for you to be able to ask questions to Elizabeth, things that are on your mind about your kids or about what they're studying or their future or, um, you know, anything a lot at all. Um, Go ahead and, and jump in and 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 um, let's hear your questions. Crickets. <laughs> uh, somebody will ask. And, oh, you could put you could type a question into the chat. That would work too. Let's right. see. Reading on Mandarin. I, I have a question. Okay. Is that Alicia? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll turn my video on so you can see. Perfect. Um, thanks for being here with us tonight. Um, I have a third grader at Cascade Elementary, which is in Orem, Utah, and he just struggles generally with school. Um, so historically, his teachers have just struggled with him. He just makes noise a lot. That's how he processes information, um, but he is behind. And so I've seriously contemplated taking him out. And I just wondered what your advice would be on that because it's really hard to support him in a program when A, he shows not a ton of desire to want to do homework generally, but then B, uh, his teachers tell me that he, I don't know that he struggles, but he's just not up to par. I know he's not up to par in Chinese. So should I seek mentoring or I want someone to just be honest with me and say, yeah, it's time to quit if it's time to quit. So it's interesting, my, um, my former editor uh, had a daughter who was in, um, uh, in San Mateo, which, which is a very, it's a strong Mandarin immersion program, um, just kind of in Silicon Valley. And she had a daughter and a son and her son did great. I mean, he was fine. Her daughter had, um, I think they eventually did some testing and she had uh, visual, some visual processing deficits and, it just did not work for her. Like English, le learning English was hard for her. I mean, le learning to read and write. I mean, she spoke it, of course, per fine. But, and eventually, and it, and, and it was kind of hard, I think, because for my editor, because she felt that, you know, somehow she was, she was, she, you know, they, she'd spent all these years doing it. But, but she pulled her out, put her in an English language program, and for her daughter, it was so much, it felt like such a relief because suddenly she could do the homework. I mean, it's, it is harder to learn to read and write Chinese. It, is, it requires more rote memorization and there are kids for whom that is not easy. I mean, kids do it, everybody does it in China. So it's not like it's impossible. Certainly it's not impossible. Um, uh, you know, uh, 1.2 billion Chinese kids do it, but, it is, um, it requires a lot of work and in a non-Chinese speaking country where there's not kind of constant, a constant cultural, uh, you're not always getting cultural reinforcement, it can be hard. So, so sometimes I think, yeah, you just say, hmm, this is not the best place. The other side of that though, is there are some kids um, and there was a boy in my youngest daughter's class for whom this was true, he had, and I, I don't know, I, I asked his mom one time and she explained it to me, but I didn't quite understand, but there are some kids for whom kind of the whole phonetics thing and all that, like they, they have, 
it's a different kind of processing. I mean, I am very dyslexic. I'm hugely dyslexic. It is amazing to me. I still work as a reporter because without spell check, I don't know, I would not be in the position I am today. Let's just say that. Um, you know, and, and, and letters switch all the time in words that I'm looking at. They didn't do that for her son with characters because characters he saw as a picture. And so he did great in Chinese. He was actually better writing Chinese than he was in English. And so I think it really depends on, on the kid and what the issues are. But I think the important thing is to, is to never forget that your, your kid is front and center because there are always gonna be options. There's always gonna, there's gonna be wonderful things that any child you know, in the United States with access to the US education system can do. And, and I would I would hope that it, it's hard sometimes to get people who really bought in, like your Chinese teacher at school, to say, you know, maybe not. Um, and you you have to just you know see as long as as long as you know that you're doing something that is going to. You know, I'm sometimes I think it's making your kid happier because then he can love school. And if if Chinese is not making it impossible for him to love school, loving school would be so much more useful going through life than loving Chinese. Um, but there are kids, I mean, you know, the boy in my daughter's class, he loved Chinese because he could do it and he had trouble with English. So it really depends on the kid. Um, there's a book, God, um, I can send you, there was a, a, a book for kids with, with learning differences that the University of Minnesota put out in conjunction, it, they were talking about immersion. Um, it's a little it's a little old now, and I think there's more information about it. But I will um, I can send the information to Craig, and then he can send it on to you. Sure, that'd be great. There's a couple more questions coming into the chat. So Dan Richards is asking, does reading Mandarin Matrix? So that's the the yeah. textbook series that we yeah, use. Yeah. Are you familiar with that yeah. at all? You've seen yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, yeah, does I mean, that count yeah. as reading for yeah, pleasure? It's, it's, oh, it's so much better than what we started out with. Oh my goodness. I mean, I. I my kids, they feel like they have read the Monkey King stories so many times in like every year, the same story with just a few extra characters added, like they could, they could recite the whole thing. And then it was Dream of the Red Chamber. So um, yeah, Mandarin Matrix is good. And it's, and, and they've, they've really expanded what they've got available. So there's like kind of all these different stories, but there's, and I, I should do a roundup on my blog because I haven't done a roundup for a while, but there's, oh gosh, what's the, there's a great catalog. Um, oh, it's out in New York. There, there's a there's a a couple of online or web based uh, bookstores that have China little, Sprout. China Maybe Sprout. Have, China yeah. Sprout. China Sprout. Really mentioned that to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because people are wondering China's where. China. Like, did you kind of assemble a library at home? Is it worth it? Or there were there were books at school? Or how did you get? How did you deal with books through your daughter's education? We books at school but I again it was my kids are old like you know so they they were the books were not fun so yeah I would I bought things from uh from uh from um trying to sprout uh I I got the um the the Mandarin Companion um there's the new one eighth press uh again I, I will I will post something I mean it, it it's especially bad when you get to like middle school because they're like, they don't want to read mm -hmm. baby books. They want to read actual stories and they can read, you know, it's hard if you're reading Harry Potter in English and you're reading Little Dumpling in Chinese because right. you want to be reading Harry Potter, but Harry Potter in Chinese is really hard. Um, and right. so, so we're starting to get more in, um, as kids move up through the ranks, I mean, I think Chinese teachers are getting better at having actually interesting books the, right. sometimes there's a real focus on there they in i am not an educator i do not claim to be an educator i don't have a degree in in education but sometimes i think there's a bit of a a bias in language teaching they, they always talk about authentic materials we have to use authentic materials but authentic materials don't work for american kids learning chinese because kids in china first they already speak chinese and second they're surrounded by characters. And third, Chinese families expect them to memorize a lot more characters than we expect our kids to memorize. And so the authentic materials at, that are at grade level, they can't read. 
And so I think it's okay to go with, you know, a, 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 a some of these books that have a constrained character set. So they're understandable. I mean, uh, it's kind of, what do they call it? The, um, the uh, comprehensible input. Like you want to read just at the level where it's easy to read so you can read a lot. And the more you read, the easier it gets. And then you can move up. Yeah, leveled readers, right? Like that yeah. kind of a series where yeah. you, you're not going over their head, but you're getting a lot of volume. I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah. yeah. Another question we've got in the chat here, um, how do we keep up their language during summer breaks? Like how, what did you do with your daughters or what do you recommend? What do you see out there that maybe the parents should be thinking about? So more and more, we're starting to see like day camps. I mean, I don't know if you have them as much in Utah because you guys are kind of spread apart. Um, in San Francisco Bay Area, there were like Mandarin day camps. I mean, where you would like, there was a jewelry making day camp because it was some mom who made jewelry and she was Chinese speaking. And so she had a day camp and you went and you made jewelry and, and everybody spoke Mandarin. So that was kind of cool. Uh, there, um, you know, we had, we had a lot of rules in our house about, we tried to limit how much TV they watched, but if they want, they could pretty much watch anything they wanted that was in Chinese, you know, so they, they, and, and for a while, there was a great cable channel here where you could, uh, it, it, I think it was out of LA. And so there were just all these movies, you know, and a lot of Kung Fu movies and, and, uh, you know, they would, I would like you, you're, you're, I considered you're watching TV in Chinese to be homework. So in the summer, go for it. Um, then when they got older, we, uh, again, did, um, did summer camps and then um, because I am a, probably a little hard on this stuff, actually I took the kids to Guilin. There's a there's actually a really nice language school there and uh, and dropped them off for a couple of weeks and you know, like they they lived in the dorms where their cousins came with them and all four of them were in the dorms. And, what age were they? How old were they? Uh, were in middle school, first year of high school. Right. Um, I mean, you know, China is an exceedingly safe country. I'm not sure I would do that here, but in China, yeah, you know, nobody was going to harass them. Nothing was going to happen. And they, you know, they had a, they were in the dorm and, um, and then they had like four hours of, um, of Chinese language a day. And then, you know, they'd go off and get dinner for themselves. And I mean, it was a, it was an amazing adventure. And I will say that my youngest who, who I think was the least, thrilled about the entire she was 13 at the time so she was the least thrilled of them ended up writing about it for one of her college essays so that's I just love these stories you know where the kids where it hits them later the value you know where they yeah. appreciate that because as parents we're taking a risk and you know providing resources and just not sure it's going to work out but when it does it's just a great thing uh, another question how do you support your kids in Chinese outside of the classroom it's kind of related to what we were talking about but what, what can parents do? You know, one thing you mentioned was letting them have screen time in Chinese. Mm -hmm. One thing I found with my kids is if you let them find the things they want, yeah. you know, that they tend to be able to hone in on it somehow better than I could. You know, when I go out, I try to find things and watch it first, but actually they kind of know what they're looking for. But, mm -hmm. you know, how did you support your kids? And it might be, you know, getting them to China, you know, like supporting your kids. What would you recommend for parents here? I think, and especially for younger kids, because you're not going to, you know, well, and right now, I mean, we can't go anywhere. So that's out. Um, yeah, you know, uh, oh, and there's, uh, again, I, I ran across this a week or so ago, and, and I will post a link to it. A lot of what's on my blog is links to things other people are, are writing about, because um, I try and be a, like a, a, a warehouse for all, a clearinghouse for all this stuff. Um, but one mom had posted a list of her, her, daughter's favorite um, Mandarin TV shows. And it's so easy now because of the internet that you can actually find this stuff like on YouTube. Um, right. And like, you know, K-drama is very popular. The Cantonese drama, or I'm sorry, the Korean drama, but actually M-drama, Mandarin drama is also getting popular. And, um, you know, so kids like to watch that. Uh, you know, they like to watch videos. Um, if you, I will be sexist here, but boys love the kung fu movies um and all the star wars actually my daughters love the star wars movies and we had all of them dubbed into chinese so they watched those a lot the the one thing i will say is if you get the disney films um the older ones the dubbing is horrible it's really muddy it's really hard to hear so because i think we got oh 
what was it, the, the, um, the Aristocats, which they loved in English, but like you could barely, I could barely understand it in Chinese. It was all blah, 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 blah. So you have to listen a bit and make sure that it's a good, that the dubbing was good if it's an English thing. But, and then, um, you know, the biggest thing is having your kids do their homework. Like I would talk to, I would go to Chinese language conferences and when I was researching the book and I would talk to teachers and I'd say, what should parents do? And they're like, just make them do their homework. Like you don't know how how huge a thing that is, and 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 I will say now, being on the other side of it, because um, certainly there were there were many fights, and I spent a lot of time sitting at the dining room table with with well, occasionally crying children. Um, it it is it, the truth is it is hard to get kids to do homework in any language. So it's like Chinese is a little harder because you have to write all the characters, but it's hard in any language. But boy, once they get that under their belt, they are um, they are well positioned. And and I, it's funny. My um, my daughter uh, she had to take a health class at, in her senior year of high school, and and one of the only options she could take because of her schedule was um, uh, what was it? It was like. Uh, the human body. It was kind. Of, it was kind of. It had a lot of anatomy in it, and uh, and it was apparently a horribly scary class because you had to memorize all this stuff. And and I said, oh well, are you gonna are you gonna take that one? She's like, oh yeah, God. After Chinese memorizing, that's easy. You know, she's she was like, oh yeah, you know, I can memorize anything. Um, where all the other kids were terrified of it, and she did fine. So yeah. there, there are useful skills you get from learning Chinese. Yeah, well, and studies show that kids get more confidence having gone through the program. Like you said, like that's a very physical, specific yeah. reference to that. Heather has got a question. She's got her hand up. Heather, what, what do you want to ask? Jump in. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm not going to turn my camera on because I just got back from swimming. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do. One question that I've had for a while now is I would really like to know uh, what my kids uh, learning Mandarin, wh what does this open for their future? I guess like job wise and all of that. Like I would really like to see them be able to use this in their careers in some way. So what kind of jobs does this open for them other than just being a translator? Oh, um, how old are your kids? Um, my oldest is 14, so he's okay. in eighth grade. Okay, so yeah, you're so yeah. So boy, there are um, so I'm trying to think of the kids I know who are a few years older than my daughter, who are in other like uh, Portland, Portland, Oregon has got one of the oldest um, Mandarin language programs, and then um, the Chinese American International School, which is a private school here in San Francisco. Uh, so one guy I know graduated from college. He, he did a major in business and a minor in Chinese because it was easy because I think he, you know, he was kind of, he had most of the coursework already. And then he got a job working as a business manager for the Chinese traveling team for the Harlem Globetrotters. Wow. All over Asia with them um, because he could speak Chinese and he was their business manager which I just thought was the coolest job in the entire world. Uh, and so did he. Uh, so there are, um, you know, in, in California, we have a inordinate number of, um, I don't know if it's still, well, it's not happening right now, but real estate agents are desperate for anybody who can speak Chinese because so many folks are coming over from China and buying property here. I think kind of as a, as a hedge against whatever might happen in the world. Um, so I was talking to one realtor who said, oh Lord, I would, hire, I would hire anyone who could work with my Mandarin clients in a second. Um, down to the, uh, the Gucci, I, I, I knew a Mandarin immersion graduate who was working at the Gucci store in the Stanford mall down by Stanford University because they have so many because the Chinese tourists they go on these tours of the Bay Area and Stanford is one of the stops which like mm -hmm. I did a graduate school at Stanford and I mean, it's a very nice place but I was like why would you, 
why would you go there to just look at it unless your kid was going to go there? But they do, like buses stop in front of Stanford, they go and they tour Stanford, they get back on, and then they go to the Stanford Mall and they go to, there's a couple of really high-end stores and Gucci was one of them and they needed Mandarin speaking staff to sell very expensive goods to all the wealthy Chinese tourists who came through, who also apparently tipped very well, this told me, so she loved that. Um, so, you know, I, again, it's, you, but the thing, the thing I will say is you never know how it's going to be useful. I mean, I speak Swedish, 8 million other people in the world speak Swedish. It's a not, it's a niche language and I do not use it for my day job generally, but like during this pandemic, it turns out that, um, one of the guys who is doing some of the really interesting work on the spike protein on uh, SARS-CoV-2 is at Uppsala University. And nobody had been able to talk to him because he was, you know, heads down busy. But I sent him an email in Swedish through the university website and said, you know, I, I and I think, I, I also think his English was, I mean, he was, of course he spoke English because they all speak English sometimes better than we do, but <laughs> he was much more comfortable in, in Swedish. And so I was able to get an interview with this guy that my colleagues hadn't been able to. And that's not Chinese, but I'm just saying there's, you know, it's, it's like this weird little superpower you've got in your pocket and you kind of don't know exactly when it's going to come in handy. I mean, the, my favorite story about this, and then I'll let somebody else ask a question is one time I was on, so we have a subway system here, BART. I was on a BART train going downtown and the doors opened and this um, clearly a mom and her daughter, the daughter was maybe eight, nine, were getting on, they were Chinese and they, um, the, the doors kind of make a noise when they're gonna close. And for some reason they startled the mom and she jumped onto the train, but her daughter did not. And the doors closed and the train went. And here's this mom from China, did not speak, uh, maybe spoke more English, but she was so distraught she couldn't speak English. And oddly, because it was San Francisco, nobody else on the train spoke Chinese. So I go up to her and I'm like, stay calm, stay calm, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be fine. We'll, you know, we'll find her. There's a and I said, we're gonna go to the next stop and we're gonna get off. And, and so we, we got off and at the end of the platform, there's her daughter standing, holding hands with this large black guy who walks down towards the mom and starts in perfect Mandarin saying, don't worry, she was crying. And I, or we went and we came back. I, um, and I asked her what was going on. And I said, we're gonna wait right here for your mom to come back and you don't need to worry. And the mom is just, like she's not realizing how surprising this is because all she cares about is her daughter's there and everything is okay. And I, I looked at the guy and I'm like, you know, I said, your Mandarin's a whole lot better than mine. And he says, yeah, I'm married to a woman from Beijing and, and we spent a lot of time in China. And I, so I studied it. And how often does he use Chinese? He uses it at home, but otherwise never. But, you know, this horrible thing could have happened. And in fact, it worked out really well because he had it in his back pocket. So that's how I think of it. I think that's great. And I think, and I think it, part of the point is that no matter what you're interested in as a career, there's a China angle on it. You know, like mm. if you're interested in biotech, I mean, there's a huge industry in China. I mean, anything that you do, there's gonna be a China angle to that if you wanna pull out your China card and, and do it. So I think it can help you open doors to get into place. The other thing I would be interested in is this idea that classmates help younger classmates yes. from the same school maybe and they're like because you know the family and it's someone's brother and they say oh actually we've got a position here like that needs to start happening in utah you know we're only seniors right now so our mm -hmm. mandarin students haven't gotten out into the world yet but if there's a way to maintain these connections and people get out because in the beginning it's hard to open those doors and find the spots but once someone's there then like hey we're looking for somebody hey do you is there someone from from my community so i think it can build itself um, Dan Richards has got a question. Can you do? You want, or can you get your mic on, Dan? Go ahead and jump in. Is it good? Hi, sorry, it's Shannon. And I'm sorry, I, I, that's okay. I'm on my husband's account. Let's see. I'll turn the video on, but I'm not promising much over here. Okay. Hi. Um, hey. You see my palatial bedroom, so you know. <laughs> um, so I just had a couple thoughts as we're talking here. 
Um, my sister is a buyer for a company that I cannot think of the name of right now. It's a big company in Northern Utah that, uh, they make like seatbelts and airbags and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. I can't think what the name is. Anyways, she's a buyer and she, um, has to speak to people in China all the time. And, and she's had to travel to China. And so I've asked her like, would it be helpful if you could speak Chinese? And she was like, oh, hugely, that would be beneficial. So I think like you're saying, like any industry, there's going to be connections, but that's a, like a specific field being a buyer or, um, you know, something like that, where you're going to be talking to people in different countries. Um, and then I had another thought and a question about Alicia. I, I didn't quite catch what grade your son is in. I think you said second. Um, I just wanted to share my, oh, third. Okay. So I wanted to share my experience. My daughter was kind of in this, a similar situation where it was like, there were tears and there was a lot of frustration going on. And we were, and she was, I have two kids in the program now. So it was our first time going through it. And we we're like, did we make the right choice? So I had heard from other parents that um, kids are typically behind until they get to about like the end of third grade and maybe, you know, the beginning of fourth, and then they really start catching on and then they start to move past their peers. Mm -hmm. And so my kind of, um, uh, well, I don't know, finish line that I was trying to get to was to get her to the end of third grade. And then I would make that decision if I should pull her out. And so that was my question to you. Is there like kind of a line where you're seeing kids really start to excel? Um, so anyway, she ended up staying in and she's doing great now, but we, uh, one more point I'll put on there is because she was, she was like, you know, like the lowest five kids in her class. And I was really worried, but she got actually some extra help from the teachers because she was in that lower group. So then I actually saw it as a little blessing that, um, she was getting more one-on-one -on -one time, which was really helpful. So I'll turn it back over. <laughs> Elizabeth, thoughts on when kids hit stride, like hold on? I think different kids hit their stride at different points, but it is true that um, they third, third and fourth grade seem to be there. There's some uh, kids really, there's a, a maturation thing that happens around fourth grade. Um, and, and I saw a lot of kids like that was, that was a point where you could say, oh, this is gonna work. Like the, it was not the Chinese, it was just kind of, you know, dealing with being in school and, and especially during COVID. I mean, are you guys back in school full-time? Utah's been in school pretty much full-time. I mean, well, wow, different yeah, districts are doing different things. There's some hybrid, but down here in St. George, it's been completely like business as usual. Okay, well beginning. that, yeah, because. The yeah. kids who, well, your kids will be ahead of everybody else's. I'm just telling you, because every place, I've, well, in California, this has been something of a wash for a year. Um, but fourth grade is often, like, it's where things, like, I don't know, some executive function kicks in, and, 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 and that's when you can tell either, oh, this was just, you know, it was rough, it's rough for every kid, versus this may not be right. Um, and, and sometimes, yeah, I will say sometimes it's good to go to a teacher who's not a Chinese teacher because they're so wedded. They love Chinese and they want your kid to stay in the program because it's so fantastic. And it might be worth going to talk to, you know, the principal or one of the other educators just to say, listen, be really honest with me. But yeah, I mean, if you can hold out to fourth grade, you can really kind of get a chance. And that way, even if they switch, they switch and you guys go th through fifth grade and then man uh, middle school starts for sixth. It depends on the district here. It's kind of half and half. About half of them are sixth grade is middle school and the other half they start junior high and seventh. So okay. So that was one thing that a teacher told me was that um, fourth grade is kind of a good time to leap because if you're going to move back to English, they still have that one year in their school where they kind of know it and they feel comfortable to to really click into English and then they go to middle school and it's not because you don't want what you don't want, or well, it it might be harder for some kids if they're shifting to all English and a new school. So it's kind of nice to stay in the same school. Right. 
Yeah, no, that's good advice. Um, yeah, it feels to me like it's kind of like tennis, you know, like in the beginning, it's not a lot of fun, but then when you finally get to the point where you can hit volley and hit and back, then all of a sudden you want to play and Chinese can be like that for the kids. Yeah. The other thing is that cognitively, like you're saying, you get to fourth grade and the kids kind of change and they no longer want to do fairy tales and children's songs. And, and so if you don't have that base by then, I think it's really hard yeah. because I think that base is really kind of critical to build on when you're cognitively more capable in fourth grade to start doing more kinds of abstract thinking and you know using the language to do things besides the concrete because my kids are in first and third and they are so comfortable to do concrete things you know they play with a toy and it's flying and they're holding it and what's happening you know it's very literal but then when you get to fourth and fifth then it turns into abstract you know you're using thought to figure things out and you need to go through that concrete stage and if you're already in fourth or fifth your brain doesn't want to go through that I think I mean I'm not an expert in this but I'm really interested in how it works are there other questions? I mean, we're hitting an hour and I, Elizabeth, I know you've got so much going on with COVID that maybe we should just call a halt here. Would well, you let's let's take one more call and then actually I have to we're we're writing letters of continued interest tonight to colleges. <laughs> yes, I'm still interested. Right. Please, still so interested. not only are you a full-time journalist, but you've got <laughs> uh, your your daughter's applying for colleges. Oh gosh, I tell you, that's like boy, you need a master's degree just in that these days. <laughs> Yeah, that's intense. Is there another question that someone wants to, to, to finish us off with here? Anyone else has got something on their mind that they would want to run by us? I'm just wondering if there's any apps or websites or, I don't know, different self-help things. Like, I feel like Stockton's a little bit behind, um, and I'm just trying to what, see what would help him best if there's programs to you know buy into or if there's something free and helpful there um so one of the things that we did and i i think i think you guys have done it in utah do you guys have a, like a parent list like an email list it, it's school no. by school some of the schools have a facebook group for the parents and they they share information there at school level but there's not really a list if you go on facebook there's a there's a nice um there's a nice uh, group the Mandarin, uh, Mandarin. If you, if you if you search Mandarin immersion parents on Facebook, there's a group that was started by some families down in Southern California that originally was just meant for actually I think the LA uh, Broadway School, but it it kind of became the national group. And people share a lot of great resources there because th there is tremendous. I mean, you really. Like you're right. I think eventually these kids are all gonna they're gonna be a Mandarin mafia out in the world and they'll all have each other's back and oh, oh, well, you know, my my brother's best friend just graduated and well, and, and you guys have that fantastic program through the university uh, through your university, so you can go all the way through. But um, uh, parents are an incredible resource. And so like we used to have a just an email list for all the families in Mandarin Immersion in San Francisco. And even just that, somebody would post and say, oh, I found a great, uh, you know, a, a great um, uh, app that you can download on your phone and it does X. I mean, the ones that I knew, it's all changed so fast that they're not really current anymore. But um, I mean, an email list or going onto that Facebook group or creating a pan Utah Facebook group so that people can share resources uh, because, you know, your teacher might tell you, oh, here's this great app, and then you can tell everybody else, and you kind of share the, the knowledge. That's great. I mean, well, that's what we're trying to do right now with Utah Matter and Founders. We've got like 120 now in the Facebook group across yeah. the state, but it's just getting started. But I'm involved in the Mandarin Immersion Parent Support Group. I think that's the one you yeah. were mentioning. I just put the, yeah. the link there for people who are interested, but I've learned a lot of things there, you know, in terms of, yeah. and, and, and like Elizabeth mentioned before, YouTube, has a lot of stuff yeah. right? if you can just get yeah. in there. And then once you get in and start seeing Chinese things and it recommends other things and your kids can kind of navigate through. I was shocked, you know, you don't have to go to a Chinese website. I mean, YouTube yeah. has a lot of Chinese language stuff that's really high quality. And it's the same stuff they're watching in China a lot of times just put onto the YouTube channel. So and there are great cartoons in Chinese. I think that the Chinese cartoons are almost more fun because they don't have all the, you know, they, they don't feel they always have to be educational. They're just fun. 
Yeah, I mean, my kids are loving some of the Chinese uh, cartoons that are out there. Well, we better wrap up because I know you've got a ton of things to do, but I really appreciate you being here and giving us this time and connecting yeah. us to San Francisco and a little bit to the nation. And um, the parents appreciate you all being here and the questions and everything. Uh, and if you've got follow up, you could message me and maybe I can get across to Elizabeth or vice versa and we can kind of have some communication channel. If you're ever out here in Utah, we'd love to, um, you know, connect you and, and um, like a dream here might be to get some kind of a community center in Utah where we could do some things and maybe even something in China, some kind of a base where the kids could have a study center. I mean, those are dreams maybe that we're thinking about. But. I've, I've always thought that somebody needs to start a, um, like a Chinese summer camp in China for kids coming from American immersion programs. Run to, run to American standards because I think the Chinese run camps I think we expect a little more oversight um, in the, in the states, and so, so yeah. But um, the other thing is, you know, as as you all are moving through, I am always looking for guest columns to for people to write for the blog. If you've you know had some cool experience with your kid, or you just want to write about what is it like to be in immersion in Utah when so many other kids, because here I think for a lot of people around the country, you know. You may be in Georgia and there's one Mandarin immersion school and people look at you like you're crazy. Whereas in Utah, when you're in immersion, people are like, oh, what language? Yeah, that's great. I'm just gonna put that. Yeah. So yeah, if anybody, if uh, you, it's easy to find my contact information in there. And if anybody ever feels like uh, writing a, um, you know, just it doesn't have to be fancy, but just you know what it's like. Here's a slice of life in uh, in our program. I, I especially love stuff from families as they're getting up in middle school and high school because your program is so built out in high school compared to most uh, most states. I mean, Minnesota is kind of the only other one that's quite that sophisticated. Yeah, no, it seems like, and, and it's still developing, you know, in terms of how it's going to yeah. be. And I think the overlay in terms of, you know, say internships and study to China, that's yeah. just getting ready to happen. We haven't yeah. really got that going yet, but that's a big priority here. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, You're really so appreciate welcome. Thank all you, you. you've shared with us. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again or see you in person when you're coming through the state. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take Elizabeth. care, everyone. Thank Good you. Good night. Good night.